All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kristen Clark. I'm the President and Executive Director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and I wanna welcome you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's Annual Legislative Conference. And welcome to Congresswoman Maxine Waters' Criminal Justice Issue Forum entitled The Dangerous Policies of Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the Trump Administration, Mandatory Minimum Sentences and Other Criminal Justice Issues. Now, my organization is one of the country's leading national civil rights organizations. We were founded in 1963 at the request of President John F. Kennedy, and we've been on the front lines fighting against voter suppression pushing for a fairer criminal, criminal justice uh, system, uh, working to hold this administration accountable, and fighting to save the Supreme Court and more. And today, uh, it's my distinct honor uh, to serve as a panelist for this discussion. However, Congressman, Congresswoman Waters has been held up with congressional business across town at the Capitol building. We are anxiously awaiting for her uh, arrival. Uh, there's no shortage of important business brewing on the Hill uh, today, uh, and she'll be with us very shortly. Uh, when the Congresswoman gets here, she will explain to you in her own words why she has held this particular criminal justice forum for uh, virtually the last 20 years, and she'll talk to you about why she has decided to make fighting for a fairer criminal justice system a very critical focal point of her work during her time in Congress. Until then, it's my pleasure to moderate today's important discussion. Now, before we dive in and turn the floor over to the panelists, I wanna make sure that I lay some context for the discussion that we're prepared to have today. <coughs> right now, in this country, we have a federal government that is in full retreat when it comes to protecting our civil rights. We have an attorney general who has reignited the war on drugs, an attorney general who has reinstated the use of private prisons, an attorney general who, who has all but abandoned the important work of confronting systemic police misconduct because, in his words, this would hurt officer morale. We've not seen a single case from this Justice Department protecting voting rights. And instead, we see a DOJ that is reversing course. This Justice Department recently filed a brief in the Supreme Court defending a voter suppression uh, program out of Ohio. They've abandoned a position on Texas's voter ID law, one that was adopted with discriminatory purpose. And two weeks ago, in an astounding move, the Justice Department filed a brief in a case where they're not even a party taking the position that Harvard University's efforts to promote racial diversity on its campus are unlawful. And then there's Betsy DeVos and Ben Carson and the themes that drive their approach to running their respective agencies is abandonment of the vulnerable. But I want to take just a brief moment to talk about where we are right now with respect to the United States Supreme Court. Right now, the Senate is taking up the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh. This is Trump's second nomination in just a year and a half to our nation's highest court. This Supreme Court nomination presents one of the biggest crises that we face uh, in our country right now, and it's one that we must all pay attention to. My organization, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, reviewed his civil rights record uh, during his 12 years on the bench. He serves now on the D.C. Circuit Court. And what we found is somebody who is clearly hostile on civil rights issues. When we looked at his opinions in the areas of voting rights, affirmative action, environmental protection, gun control, criminal justice, reproductive rights, and more, we find somebody who has a very narrow view when it comes to constitutional rights and someone who will be on the wrong side in issues that implicate the rights of African Americans. But here's the real problem. That's what we know, but there's all of what we don't know. This Senate has refused to insist that the White House, White House turn over all of the records from his six years in the White House working alongside former President George W. Bush. 
During that time, he touched incredibly important issues, including criminal justice and other issues like torture and surveillance, hate crimes, affirmative action, and more. For the first time in history, this White House invoked so-called executive privilege to deny the Senate access to these documents and materials, materials that are very relevant to who he is. On top of this, the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, has tried to hide even more material from the public by stamping them committee confidential. We saw Senator Booker, in an act of civil disobedience, go ahead and release these materials to the public last week, and he's continued to do so this week. But the reality is that more than 90% of this nominee's record remains hidden. It's not been produced, and it begs the question, what are they hiding? For all of the issues that we're going to talk about today, the Supreme Court matters. The Supreme Court sets precedent on some of the most important and consequential issues in our country. They even make life and death decisions to the extent that they have the power to stay executions. It's time we all rise up and express outrage at this sham nomination process. I encourage you, when you leave today, to call your senator and tell them to press pause on this nomination until all of his records are revealed. With that context, I want to turn to our panel today and focus on some of the biggest problems when it comes to race and mass incarceration in our country. Uh, we're going to talk about race and policing. We're going to talk about the FBI's new designation of African-American activists as so-called black identity extremists. We'll discuss stand your ground laws and their problematic effects, mandatory minimum sentencing, and the prospect of sentencing reform in this era. And lastly, we'll discuss criminal justice legislation that is in Congress now and that Congresswoman Maxine Waters has been a main champion of. With all of these issues in the backdrop is President Donald Trump's administration. And again, the policies of this Justice Depar Department, which is turning its back on the vulner vulnerable. Um, I want to take um, a moment to recognize some special guests who um, may be in the room or uh, may be joining us lately. Um, mothers of the movement, do we have any of the mothers here? I know that they have been present um, uh, and loud uh, throughout this week and thank them for their courage and their leadership and their ability to take their personal tragedy to push for needed policing reform in our country. So let me turn now to introducing our panelists. I'll first uh, introduce uh, Ms. Jessalyn McCurdy, who is Deputy Director of the ACLU's Washington Legislative Office. She's worked for the ACLU for several years and also served as counsel with the House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security. Notably, she was the lead House counsel for the historic Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 when it passed Congress. Um, today, she will speak with us on race, policing, and criminal justice legislation. Next to her, we have the esteemed Nikichi Taifa, who is the advocacy director for, the criminal, uh, for criminal justice at the Open Society Foundations. She's also founding director of the Equal Justice Program at Howard University Law School and has previously served as legislative counsel for the ACLU and as Public Policy Counsel for the Women's Legal Defense Fund and the National Prison Project. Additionally, as a private practitioner, she's represented indigent adults and juveniles and has written and spoken extensively on issues of criminal justice reform. Ms. Taifa will speak with us today about mandatory minimum sentences, sentencing policy, policy and criminal justice legislation. And then next to her, I'm pleased to introduce Kemba, Kemba smith Pradia. Ms. smith Pradia graduated high school and continued her education at the prestigious Hampton University. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing her uh, for more than 20 years. And as I noted to her a moment ago, she may not remember this, but when I was in law school, we took up her case 
uh, while I was an intern at the Legal Defense Fund. What happened to Kemba was simply a nightmare and emblematic of the ways in which our criminal justice system over penalizes African Americans. She was issued a 24 and a half year sentence in a federal prison for her ex-boyfriend's drug activities. In December 2000, after serving six and a half years, President Clinton commuted her, se commuted her sentence to time served. She then went on um, to college. Um, she is a domestic violence survivor. She is a mother, she is a public speaker, she is an advocate, she's an author, and she's a great source of inspiration to me. She shares her traumatic real life experience in her powerful book, Poster Child, The Kemba Smith Story. And in December of 2014, Kemba was appointed by Governor Terry McAuliffe of Virginia to serve as a member of the Virginia Criminal Sentencing Commission. She's spoken at the White House and testified before Congress and the UN regarding a variety of criminal justice issues, including crack cocaine sentencing, mandatory drug sentencing, women and incarceration, felony disenfranchisement, reentry, and more. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing her remarks. Um, so with that, we'll start um, to my right. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for coming. I want to thank um, Congresswoman Waters for inviting me to talk about some very important and serious issues uh, facing um, the black community and the uh, country as a whole. Um, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about, and then I want to turn it up to, over to Nikichi, a little bit about um, criminal justice uh, reform. Um, as you may or may not have heard, there is a lot of discussion about criminal justice reform um, here in Washington geared toward the federal system, but um, it's really one of these situations where the devil's in the details. So, you know, currently in this country, we incarcerate over 2.2 million people on any given day in federal, state, and local prisons and jails. Um, uh, in, in the federal system, we have over 180,000 people who are in federal prisons across the country. Many of them, almost over 46% of them, are there for drug offenses. Um, many of those drug offenses don't um, are not associated with violence and are, are low-level uh, drug offenses. Many people in federal prison for drug um, offenses are there for for the first time, and some of those people are serving life without parole sentences. We have become an incarceration nation. Um, again, in the federal system, a lot of our incarceration is driven by the fact that the drug, the federal drug law laws are uh, um, based on mandatory minimum sentences and mandatory minimum sentences are sentences where a judge cannot deviate or under very few circumstances, a judge can deviate from the statutory sen sentence that's on, on the books. Um, and that often, in, in the way that the federal system is set up, is that people who, and, and Kimba will talk a little bit more about this, is that initially, in 1984 when there was the um, Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act which created the Sentencing Commission and also created sentencing guidelines in the federal system which were mandatory, it was set up so that the higher level drug dealers would be able to get, at least in theory, would be held responsible for lar the larger amounts of drugs that were being trafficked. But in in reality, the way that the system plays out is that one of the few ways you can get from under a mandatory minimum sentence is to cooperate with prosecutors. And we can talk some more about prosecutors and their power in this system and why, for example, it is so important that people get out in November. And if you're, if you haven't, if, I'm, I'm sure all the primary elections are pretty much done now but in November to make sure the right types of prosecutors are being elected on the local level because they have so much power in the criminal justice system. 
they're given almost um, total discretion um, in terms of how they charge cases, who they charge, and who they don't charge in cases. And uh, from our perspective, the way we can affect that is to get out and take seriously the elections of uh, local district attorneys. So I know everybody comes here, they're looking for their marching orders, so that's my, one of my first marching orders. Take seriously these elections. We saw it in Ferguson. We saw what happened in Ferguson when somebody, that a more reform-minded um, district attorney ran and beat out Bill McCollum, who was the district attorney in, in Ferguson who would not charge the officer that killed Michael Brown. We have to take these um, elections seriously, and we have to take the role of the district attorneys um, on the local level very seriously, because they're literally, on many days, life they make life or death decisions. And when, when people look like us, oftentimes the decisions are death, and we cannot stand for that. But in the federal system, the prosecutors are not elected, but the prosecutors are under the um, supervision and, and guise of the Attorney General, who as we know now is Jeff Sessions. Kristen uh, laid out some of the policies that he has, he has already changed from the last administration's Department of Justice, such as one of the first policy changes that he initiated less than two weeks after he was confirmed was to reverse the policy on uh, private prisons. The Obama administration had decided that it was going to um, get out of the big, basically private prison business and uh, stop relying so much on private prisons. The first thing Jeff Sessions did was roll that policy back. One of the second policies Jeff Sessions rolled back was a policy around how you, in the federal criminal justice system, how you charge people who have immigration violations. And uh, under the prior administration, there was a choice of whether you wanted to charge those people criminally or whether you wanted to sen sen send them through the civil system, which is the ICE system, whereas they wouldn't have a um, conviction, but they would potentially still be deported. This administration has completely changed that policy and their priority is to criminally charge anybody with even a minor immigration um, uh, a, a violation and deport them back to their country. Then one of the third Im, Im, Im important policies that this Attorney General uh, rolled back was the policy around how you jar, charge people, particularly in drug cases. Because as I said, in the federal system, almost 50, 46% of the people that are in federal prison are in federal prison for drug offenses. What Jeff Sessions said is, instead of looking at those individual cases and making thoughtful decisions about how we're gonna charge them based on the, the role that they played in a particular drug case, we're just gonna charge people with the harshest crime we can prove. We're gonna charge them with the most serious, harshest crime that we, can, we as prosecutors can prove which is, it was a complete 180 from where the past administration landed in terms of trying to focus on drug crimes that were serious, but not try to pull in people who did not have serious um, involvement um, in a drug trade and not rely on mandatory minimums to ruin people's lives. So this is the context that we're dealing with in the federal system. We're dealing with an attorney general, that in all those policies, what those policies result in, again, a incarceration nation, but also a reigniting of the war on drugs, which as we know is a war on black and brown people. So again, immigration policies, war on brown people. Sentencing policies, war on black people. So don't be fooled by the kind of uh, surface policy changes that are happening in this administration that may not look like there is a, it's a concerted um, uh, strategy to focus on people who we know that this administration does not support and does not care about. It is clear where they're coming from. They, are, they have ignited a war on black and brown people through their policy decisions and we cannot 
sleep on that. In terms of what is going on here in Washington, Jeff Sessions has been really very clear about the fact that he has, does not support any type of reform of the system. He supports the system as it is and wants it to, um, in fact, again, has changed policies so that he can use the current system to incarcerate more, more people. There is a move by um, some bipartisan um, members of Congress, but also some folks in the White House to adopt what is called prison reform. And that's basically reforming what we call the back end of the system. Um, so that's basically after people are already arrested, convicted, um, serve time in prison, then we'll give them a few days off their sentence. And that's what, what we're gonna call reform. That's what they're gonna call reform. Um, but what we know is we have to stop people from coming into the system. We have to change the sentencing laws so that people don't go into the system, have their life ruined, then they give you a few days off your sentence and feel good about it and think that they've reformed the system. Absolutely not. That is not reform. We have to change the sentencing laws so that the right people, if, if that we make the right decisions about who we charge for crimes and who does not deserve to be charged for a crime and take into account the seriousness of the crime. We have to change the system and any reform that does not reflect that is not a serious version of reform. And so that is, that, that is what we've been dealing with here. We have a group of people who want to quote unquote reform the system, but not do it in a way that's gonna really result in addressing the problems of the system. And the, again, the problems of the system are that we have 180,000 people that are incarcerated in federal prisons across the country, most of them for drug crimes, and we're doing nothing to try to avoid that. So any type of reform that we support or that we need to be a part of has to deal with the, what drives the amount of people in the federal system, and that is drug sentences, and that is mandatory minimums. And that's one reason why Representative Waters every year does this forum to remind us and every year introduces her bill that would eliminate mandatory minimums. See, that's the real solution to this. We, uh, mandatory minimums need to be eliminated and that's why she introduces that bill every year so that we don't forget what we need to do to reform this system. And that is to get rid of mandatory minimums. And I'll stop there and turn it over to Kichi, but we're gonna be here, we're gonna answer questions. We can talk some more about kind of what is going on here in Washington in quote unquote the name of reform and really be clear about what we need to reform a system that's not only broken, but really on some level is so broken that it will never be reformed, it never could be reformed in the right. It needs to be reimagined and re-envisioned, re okay? We don't have people here in Washington that are, that are willing to do that though. So um, what we really need to be thinking about is, is people, how can we reimagine this system? How can we re-envision this system? So that for example, people that have drug um, addictions are not sent to the prison, they get the treatment that they need. We, need to, we have to think about this differently. We're wasting people's lives. We're willing to put people away for life without parole, without the opportunity of coming home, and they haven't ever seen or touched a drug or sold a drug, that they're just tangentially part of a, a drug conspiracy that somebody has flipped on them and, and laid the weight of an entire drug conspiracy on them and they go to prison for, for life without parole. That's not a system. That system is broken and can never be fixed. So we have to think, think differently about this. Uh, thank you so very much, Justin. Justin, my partner in crime over here. Uh, so again, my name is Nikichi Taifa. I'm Advocacy Director for Criminal Justice with Open Society uh, Foundations. And I also convened the Justice Roundtable, which is a coalition of over 100 organizations that have been working for the past 16 years in Washington uh, on criminal justice reform issues. And I really want to thank Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who has consistently and unabatedly and unabashedly for the past, I don't know how many years, decades, decade after decade, mm -hmm. you know, what, what did you get out, Kimber? 2000. Well, I know it's been since then, because you've been on every single one of the past years, you know what I'm saying, um, has shined a light. Okay, 
on the justice system and on injustice. And we really, really want to thank her for convening once again this very critical forum because this demonstrates that despite the madness of the moment, with an attorney general bent on turning back the clock on criminal justice reform, that we are still in a space where we can build community, where we can display solidarity, where we can maintain the inspiration of justice in this moment where transformational change is so very critical. So y'all just let me be Nikichi for a second, just do just a, a second of call and response. When I say justice, you say now, justice. Now. Justice. Now. When I say justice, you say now, justice. Now. Justice. Now. So you see, that's what justice looks like. But the mantra of justice now was not always justice now. Because back in the day, the need for reform to criminal justice laws and policies, it was not shouted from the rooftops. It was not publicly proclaimed. In fact, it was shoved under uh, the rug. It was talked about in hushed terms. But thankfully, largely because in the words of Brian Stevenson, we've become much more proximate uh, to the issue where we have directly impacted people right here on the front lines telling uh, their stories. I know Robert Ship's sisters there in the audience, people coming and family members coming, sharing the stories of people who are directly um, impacted. That discussion about criminal justice and mass incarceration is not the lightning rod that it was over three decades um, ago. You see, three decades ago, both Republicans and Democrats Alike, all of us were horrible on criminal justice uh, issues. Every year or so during the early 90s, regardless of administration, I know because I was there, we fought against these unwieldy omnibus crime uh, bills culminating in what I always call the granddaddy of all crime bills, the crime bill of 1994, the Violent Crimes Control and Safe Streets Act. 1994, and this bill features the largest expansion of the federal death penalty in modern times, the gutting of habeas corpus uh, reform, the evisceration of the exclusionary rule, the trying of 13-year-olds as adults, the abolition of Pell educational grants for prisoners, the refusal to address the crack powder disparity, 100,000 new cops on the streets, and money, 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 money to states to lock up more and more people for longer, longer periods of time in exchange for loads more money to build more uh, prisons. Because you see, the prevailing narrative at that time was tough on crime. It was a narrative that caused then-candidate Bill Clinton to leave the campaign trail to go back to Arkansas to oversee the execution of a mentally challenged a person. It was the same narrative that brought about the one to one ratio between a crack and powder cocaine. That's the narrative which supported the transfer of youth to adult courts and popularized the myth of the black child as super predator. So it's not surprising that we saw the advent of more and more punitive criminal punishment laws, which caused the rate of incarceration of black men and women to astronomically um, uh, uh, rise. And although we call our system a criminal justice system, it seldom meets out justice, but it punishes. Yeah. And it punishes so very severely. It's no secret to this group, to this audience, that the US leads the world in incarceration with over 2.3 million people beyond bars. It's no secret to this audience that we have less than 5% of the world's population, yet almost a quarter of the world's incarcerated people. And it's no secret to this group that the primary contributor to this massive over-incarceration has been harsh, lengthy, and unfair mandatory minimum sentencing schemes. Let there be no mistake about it. There are no mitigating or extenuating circumstances for judges to consider when it comes to mandatory minimum sentences. It doesn't matter if a college student gets caught up with the wrong guy, he beats her so bad she's scared to come forward about his drug dealing. It doesn't matter if she's pregnant when thrown into prison. It doesn't matter whether the judge or prosecutor admitted that she never used to handle any drugs. The only thing that matters is the weight of the drug and the uh, 
Yeah. Conspiracy. The conspiracy, conspiracy laws, etc. The mandatory minimum drug laws here, but she's got to serve time. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years or more, sometimes life without parole. And that is the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. The person convicted of a first time nonviolent drug offense. However, if we are really serious about ending mass incarceration, we must be willing to take the bull by the horns and not to be afraid to address the higher hanging fruit, i.e. those convicted of offenses described as violent, those with prior arrests, etc. Indeed, it really would be helpful if the term violent were redefined and the narrative changed. Should it be considered a violent crime? If a gun is present but not brandished, well in Angelo. Should one be considered a violent offender if convicted under broad conspiracy laws but was not directly involved in any violent um, act, Michelle West? And if someone has already served a lengthy prison sentence, has aged out of criminality, is now over 60 years old, and their incarceration no longer serves the interest of justice, should the quote-unquote violent crime label continue to preclude them from Release William Underwood. Come on, preach, sir. Indeed, <laughs> we need a new narrative on the criminal punishment system if we are to end the mass incarceration. And let me be clear about it. By ending mass incarceration, I do not simply mean cutting the prison population in half. The prison population is growing so rapidly that unless we address and abate the underlying causes of crime, it will be impossible to even stay at the halfway mark, which in and of itself is astronomical. We need to put policies in place that seriously tackle the underlying causes of criminal behavior and aggressively slows down admissions to prison and speeds up exits from prison. If we are to stop the spiraling growth of the prison population and tackle rampant racism in our system of punishment. We must express outrage. We must act to end unconsciously lengthy mandatory minimum sentencing schemes, regardless of whether we're motivated by fiscal, religious, big government, or racial concerns. Such punishment must be deemed unacceptable, not just to society, but to our own personal consciousness as well. And that brings us to one of the primary consciousness of this Congress, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who year after year has been on the forefront of legislative advocacy in opposition to mandatory minimum sentences. The latest iteration being the Mandatory Minimum Reform Act of 2017, HR 3800, which would eliminate, eliminate, end it, cut it out, mandatory minimum sentences for federal drug offenses. The bill would restore judicial discretion by repealing statutorily mandated minimum sentences for drug crimes and allow judges to make individualized determinations which take into account the defendant's culpability in the crime committed, his or her danger to society, rather than a one-size-fits-all sentencing mandate prescribed by Congress. Passage of this bill would help to refocus law enforcement and corrections resources or major drug traffickers or drug cartels as opposed to those convicted of low level drug offenses. So I'm gonna conclude again with how I began. When I say justice, you say now justice. Now. Justice. Now. When I say justice, you say now justice. Now. Justice. Now. Justice. now. See, until we express our outrage and shout it from the rooftops, until we do with these little red badges I see around here that says, we are the ones that we have been waiting for. Raise your hand if you have one of those. We are the ones. We, we are the ones. <coughs> Unless we shout it from the rooftops, it will never happen. So again, thank you very much. Um, Nikichi is our queen. And Jesslyn, um, I think it's ironic that it's all black women that are here this year, but um, Yes, let's, let's, let's give us a round of applause. Um, in the spirit of uh, Nikichi, Jesslyn, 
Kirsten, um, myself, Maxine Waters, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who I'll know he'll be here in a, in a minute. It, it, it has been a, a journey. And um, for me to, as was mentioned, to sit on this panel once again and to still know that we haven't un unraveled um, this issue of the war on drugs, which is more of a war of people of color. Um, I'm, I'm moved. Um, there are several things that I, I want to say and mention, um, but I'm trying to figure out in my head which way to go. And so for me, first and foremost, I am grateful that I was released from federal prison. I was sentenced to 24 and a half years as a first-time nonviolent drug offender. Um, the prosecutor said that I never handled, used, or sold any of the drugs that were involved, but yet and still they held me accountable for that amount of drug weight. And just hearing some of these things, um, and, and, and think, I know you all kept up with the Kim Kardashian um, speaking up for Miss Alice Johnson, which praise the Lord that we got that one little victory. Uh, not little victory, because to Alice Johnson and her family, that is a big victory. Um, but when I think about who commuted my sentence, Clinton, but he also signed documentation that allowed the prison population to boom, which I was part of that boom. You know, we can't be, and when I came out of prison, I was so, so grateful to him, and I know Alice Johnson is so, so grateful to Trump, but as a black community, we need to stop taking the crumbs. Okay, I remember walking out of federal prison and being in tears because there were women in FCI Danbury, they locked the prison down, they were yelling, wishing me well as I walked out of that federal prison. But I knew that the majority of those women needed to be walking right out of that prison with me. And if you all remember the movie 12 Years a Slave and the end and when, I don't remember his name, walked off that plantation, the feeling that he had leaving those people behind, that's the same feeling, survivor's guilt, that I live with having coming out of that situation. So another year comes, and I'm talking about my friend Michelle West. Anybody here from Michigan? Can you raise your hand? Any Michigan folks? Okay, well, I need to make sure that you all pick up this because she's from Michigan, and as Nikichi spoke about, she has a life sentence, was never in trouble before, and has already served 25 years of her sentence. And she applied for commutation. Um, her daughter went to the White House when President Obama was in office, and President Obama had a lot on his plate, but he needed to open them prison doors for a whole lot more people, especially the way Trump is acting buck wild and doing whatever the hell he wants to do. Excuse my French. But I'm going to make sure I stay on task because I know that there's a video that they want to show that talks about how I wound up in federal prison, and I'm just gonna make a few comments <laughs> after that. But I want you to understand that when we talk about a Jeff Sessions that wants to um, ramp up penalties, again, for people of color in this drug war, ma majority of people, but I mean, we talk about people of color in this drug war, but we know there's the opioid epidemic, where it's majority white people, where now they're like, oh, well, we need prison reform because some of those opioid epidemic people aren't getting life sentences, so at least they could serve their time and get a smack on the wrist. Well, Kimba Smith, they tried to keep me behind bars for 24 and a half years, and I was seven months pregnant. I turned myself in in 1994, and I wasn't supposed to be released from federal prison until 2016. Michelle West is looking at a document every day with no release date. That is unacceptable in this country. And so this film is going to show BT was heavily involved in my case. I thank God for George Curry, who published Emerge Magazine, which we need more outlets that highlight individual stories so we can educate these legislatures about what's going on, that we're not just animals, we're not monkeys, that we're human freaking beings that have families and that you are ruining families. So in seeing this video, though, I'm going to be real. This is the Congressional Black Caucus. There are black communities that judge us for the choices that we make without even knowing the stories. 
understand there is a story. And again, for me, I'm not a person that's been to federal prison to say, oh, I didn't do anything wrong or I didn't know he was hustling. Yeah, he was hustling. And today, because of how I've been educated about the capitalist nature of this country and what it's doing to our people and this war on drugs and who's actually bringing the drugs in, his brother, he's deceased because he was murdered, the, guy, the drug dealer that I was in a relationship with, but his brother is still in prison himself, Waynesworth Hall, that has served over probably 20 years in prison and has a life sentence too. Yeah, hustling is not something that people should do. It's bad behavior. But you need to think about the over $30,000 and billions of dollars that's being spent on individuals. Most Republicans care about the money. Well, if you care about the money, then let's stop wasting the money and preventing people from going in on the front end, doing some real prison reform so that people can have not just prison reform, reform these freaking, um, um, uh, what do you call it? No, reform the systems, reform our educational system, reform our housing system, reform our um, employment system. People need opportunities. So I'm play the video and I'm gonna try to stay on my time limit. Gymnastic, uh, summer camp, computer camp. Would it be the two hours in the rain playing or us running around doing <laughs> exercises? And we did a lot together. But in 1991, when Kimba went to study at Hampton University, she met Peter Michael Hall at a party. He was a big time drug dealer. The man the Smiths say would ultimately turn their world into a living hell. He knew who she was, that she was very naive, that she was comfortable, and he basically. Kimball became Peter's girlfriend and his punching bag. In 1993, he was indicted on a list of drug charges. Kimba, who was then seven months pregnant, also took the fall. She was convicted of conspiracy to distribute roughly 500 pounds of crack cocaine, money laundering, and making false statements to a federal agent. The conspiracy conviction means that by knowing and participating in Peter's drug dealing, Kimba was also responsible for the entire drug operation. Kimba Smith is serving a 24 and a half year prison sentence here at the Federal Correctional Institution in Danbury, Connecticut. From the street, you can see trees, flowers, and beautiful landscaping. But beyond the top of this hill is what prison officials don't want our cameras to videotape. It's the facility surrounded by rows of barbed wire, security cameras, and prison guards. But we were granted a one on one interview with Kimba. As she walked into the visiting room, you can see the toll this ordeal has taken on her. For the people who've never seen me, just tell everybody how you know me. I think that the easy thing to say that I was fine, but um, that's not the case. And the odd side is I'm struggling to try to maintain my growth while I'm here, my mental, physical, and emotional growth. Kimba says that during the court case, prosecutors admit that she did not use, handle, or sell crack cocaine. But because of the large quantity of drugs, Kimba became another victim of stiff minimum mandatory sentencing law. It doesn't make sense to me at all. I think it's a total waste. As for Peter, he didn't do any prison time. He was found in Washington State. With everything you know now about Peter and after everything he's done to you, how do you feel about him? Do you, do you hate him in any way? Um, no, I can't say that I hate him because of my faith. But Kimba says 
She stayed with Peter because she was terrified of him and what he might do. There are things uh, verbal and physical abuse um, where he would go into rages, strangling me, and it was to the point where I thought that I was going to die. Right, my mom, she knew that Vivian, he knew what was there. And none of that. Best friend. And none of that. And of course, she couldn't even know about it. Let's talk about your family. How are they coping? So um, my parents are my heroes, so I thank God for their support, um, and, and they did go through a whole lot that I don't have the time to really go into. Um, as, as far as Congresswoman Waters, um, I do have to highlight that she was a staunch supporter, and basically I can remember her being at the Million Woman March and me sitting in the television room in federal prison in Danbury and I heard Congresswoman talking about my case and how she was gonna do whatever she could to make sure that my case saw justice. And um, you know, ever since coming home, um, she's been supportive and like has been mentioned, I've been on this panel. Um, I'm very honored to be on this panel, but I'm very disgusted every year to be talking about the same issue. And I can remember fresh out of prison like the first year when I came here and I was sitting next to Ted Shaw from NAACP Legal Defense Fund and I asked him, I asked out loud, I was like, why did God free me? You know, and so for me, um, it's been me coming to grips with um, having to go over the same story over and over and over again and I do it for the two reasons one advocacy because I'm trying to bring Michelle West and other people home and change the laws and make sure our grandchildren don't go through this crap but also I do it because I also accept responsibility and um, I feel like I want to catch our young kids early 
And so I do a lot of speaking at high schools, at colleges, to prevent young people from going down the same path, and also to let them know about the system, and also to encourage them, because I've had some lawyers come up to me and tell me, I read your story in high school, and you're the reason why I'm a lawyer today. So um, for me, you know, the, the, the magazine came out, um, Congresswoman Waters, Congressman Bobby Scott was supportive. Um, the NAACP ended up taking on my case pro bono um, for free. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund took on my case for free, but it wasn't because they felt sorry for poor little Kimba Smith or the fact that I was from Virginia and Elaine Jones, the director at the time, was from Virginia. It was the fact that fastest growing population at that time was black women, and she said that she wanted to do everything she could to bring me home, but she also wanted to set a precedent for other people so that this case, them winning this case, could help other people. Unfortunately, I kept getting denial after denial. Um, there's a lot of prosecutorial misconduct that goes on. I think Jessalyn got in, prosecutors have too much power. Number one, because basically a prosecutor that knows of my case, knows of the abuse, knows of the violence, there's no reason why a prosecutor shouldn't be trying to have some kind of diversion program for individuals so maybe I don't have to wear the scarlet letter because I've learned from my mistakes and if I want to travel outside of the country, I've got to worry about where well, are they going to threaten to send me back to the, to the U.S. because of my drug conviction here in this country. That's happened when I went over to Canada to, to go speak. Um, but there are several collateral consequences to a person coming out of prison. Um, and, you know, there are a variety of issues that I could speak on, but I try to be um, obedient as far as my time frame. There are so many wrongs, so many wrongs with our system. And so it's like, what nugget, what piece do you attack? And so, you know, Jesslyn. And, and Nikichi, and, and, and when we talk about this issue of prison reform and versus sentencing reform, where do we attack it all? You know, are we supposed to be happy with this little bit of um, freedom that we can get from this administration because we feel like as black people we may not get anything else? Or when we organize and come to the Congressional Black Caucus, we make an agreement, a pact, that we're gonna move forward from here and do something with our own communities. Make sure that we're out here voting. Make sure we pick up the phone and call our congressional member and give our opinion about what's going on. And so I take all of this personal when it talks about criminal justice and the war on drugs, and especially when I hear Trump or Jeff Sessions saying the death penalty for drug dealers. Well they would have wanted to kill me according to my conspiracy to distribute crack cocaine and hold me accountable for 255 of keys of crack cocaine even though I didn't handle, use, or touch the drugs. So our system is fundamentally flawed. And when Jessalyn was talking about our vision of this system, we need to think about what we even consider a crime. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. There are too many people <coughs> in this country being incarcerated. Are we just going to punish and incarcerate everybody? When do we think about what is the root cause? What are the root problems? When are we going to start thinking about these issues like some of the other countries across the world? And so I'm going to bow down, but I am once again honored to be here. And I'm sorry I didn't go through the intricacies of my story because it did take a whole lot in order for me to be free and to get executive clemency. But personally, it's, it's, it's not about me anymore. And I, I'll share my story, but I'm going to still be a voice for those that I left behind. And I'm grateful to um, the platform of what I've been given um, since being home. And if you want to hear about the wonderful things that I've done since being home, Google me and everything. But I can't just be on my soapbox today talking about me. Free Michelle West. Free William Underwood. Um, I thank, thank you. Thank you for anybody in here here because they got a family members incarcerated every year. There are family members that come in here because they want their family member to see justice too. Vita, thank you for being here. All of you all that are here, thank you because those are the first steps in moving forward and trying to get your family member home. My parents, 
my dad said he, he didn't care who he was sitting next to, that he was going to share my story because you never know who they could be or what kind of influence they can have. So do not lose hope. Do not lose courage. Keep fighting for your family right. members. Right. Thank you, Kemba. <laughs> and how many of you all are following the horrible case, the fatal shooting of Botham Jean down in Dallas, Texas? I just want to note very briefly that we're not joined by Mr. Crump because he's working with the family right now. So let's pray, let's extend our prayers for that fa uh, to that family for their tremendous loss. It is just another stark reminder of the crisis we face in this country. A police officer who burst into a man's own home and shoots him dead. Um, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome my hero, a tremendous public servant, a woman at the forefront of the resistance movement in our country, someone whose courage and no-nonsense approach to this work inspires us all. Let's give a warm welcome to Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Everybody, reclaiming my time. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for being here this afternoon uh, to talk with us uh, about what is going on, uh, not only in this administration, but specifically with the Department of Justice and with Sessions. And so I know that our panelists, who have been so wonderful uh, to be here to participate today, have already started this conversation. Let me first give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and so um, let me just say that uh, we have been you know, in committee this morning, and I'm sorry that I could not have been here uh, when you first got started. And you know, it just seems that uh, we get interrupted in our work too often, and this should have been set aside, the time should have been set aside, because the Black Caucus is doing its thing this weekend. But it just so uh, turns out that the uh, 
the chairman of all of the committees I guess got together from the other side and decided they were going to continue to do business and which delayed me and all of our members who have these workshops going on. So I guess uh, when we take charge and we take it back, we'll fix all of that. <laughs> uh, let me share a few thoughts with you, but first let me thank you, Christian Clark, President and CEO of the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights for assisting me today, for moderating, uh, for being so wonderful, for doing all of the work you do, doing all the way out into California, where we had uh, thousands who were left off of the voter rolls and the work that you're doing with our Register of Voters. Give her a big round of applause. And so let me just welcome you to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference. This conference is very important to CBC members. Uh, the ALC affords us the opportunity to communicate our legislative priorities to the communities we serve, along with the broader audience of concerned citizens, students, and activists, as well as local and state leaders. For roughly 20 years, I've served as honorary host to a criminal justice issue forum examining the unjust application of mandatory minimum sentencing. However, over the last two years, Donald Trump, and his administration have forced me to expand the issues on which this forum focuses. This is because this White House and this Department of Justice, led by President Donald Trump and Attorney General Jeff Sessions, have spent the better part of two years trying to roll back many of the achievements we have made, not only on mandatory minimums and sentencing policy, but a wide range of criminal justice and civil rights issues. Their despicable actions led to my decision last year to expand this forum beyond just an examination of federal sentencing policy to one which more broadly covers a variety of issues on which Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions have sought to turn back the clock. This year, we, we have convened a special expanded issue, criminal justice issue forum entitled the dangerous policies of Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the Trump administration, mandatory minimums, and other criminal justice issues. While we spent many years gaining ground on criminal justice and civil rights issues, the Trump administration and Jeff Sessions' Justice Department in particular has managed to reverse much of the progress for which all of us here in this room and the activists around the country have fought. Sessions and Trump, have replaced that progress with a divisive atmosphere, which has thwarted constructive dialogue. It is for this reason that I thought it was incredibly important to assemble a broad range of advocates and experts to discuss exactly both what damage has already been done, what is at stake for the future, and I'm looking forward to your interacting with them, giving them your thoughts and opinions on what we can and what we must do to protect our communities, to prevent the senseless deaths of unarmed young men and women, to ensure that law enforcement acts appropriately and consistent with the Constitution and best practices, and to ensure that our criminal justice system and sentencing laws reflect fundamental principles of justice, fairness, and equality. Moreover, I want to hear about what has been going on this morning. I want to interact as much as I can, uh, having you know, come late, uh, and understand the thoughts on what we need to do to stand up to Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump. And of course, you know, I always have some thoughts of my own. They don't usually <laughs> like them, but I don't mind sharing them wherever I am, uh, and to, no matter who I'm talking to. As many of you know, I haven't held back my thoughts and feelings and opinions about this administration. For a long time, just like many of you, I've been out there fighting. I've been fortunate to be joined in the fight by other public elected officials, advocates, and community leaders, as well as many of my congressional colleagues, which notably includes my distinguished fellow CBC members. Uh, do we have any CBC members in the audience here? Oftentimes they rotate and they attend many of the forums. If they come in, I would like to have an opportunity to introduce them to you. I want to thank all of those who came to join this important conversation. We have a lot to discuss. Today, in this administration with Jeff Sessions, we have an attorney general who doesn't care about justice or equality. 
He's a throwback to the Jim Crow era. Jeff Sessions has a history of making racist and racially charged statements and has, at best, a poor record on civil rights. He has called the NAACP and the ACLU un-American and communist-inspired and once said he was okay with the KKK until he learned they smoked pot. We know who Jeff Sessions is. We know who Donald Trump is. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the two of them have initiated a series of decisive actions to undo the criminal justice progress that we have made in a number of areas. In May, Jeff Sessions directed federal prosecutors to pursue the harshest possible sentences, including mandatory minimum sentences for low-level drug offenders. He issued a memorandum rescinding Obama, the Obama administration policy, established by then Attorney General Eric H. Holder, Jr., under which prosecutors were to reserve the toughest charges for high-level drug traffickers and violent criminals. Attorney General Sessions, May 10th memorandum instructed prosecutors to charge and pursue the most serious, readily provable offense. Sessions memorandum explicitly stated, by definition, the most serious offenses are those that carry the most substantial guidelines sentence, including mandatory minimum sentencing. In 2013, when Attorney General Holder was a panelist at this very ALC issue forum to discuss the Obama administration's attempt at sentencing reform, just five years later, Jeff Session has now done away with much of former Attorney General Holder's progress. So in Congress, I've introduced the Mandatory Minimum Reform Act H.R. 3800, which eliminates draconian mandatory minimum sentences for crimes involving controlled substances and restore judges' discretion to issue sentences in the interest of justice and fairness. The Sessions and Trump agenda doesn't end with antiquated, severe mandatory minimums policies. In the area of policing, Donald Trump and Attorney General Jeff Sessions have slowly abandoned the role that the Justice Department and the federal government has historically played in addressing issues, excessive use of force by local police departments. Last September, the Jeff Sessions Justice Department announced that it was changing the scope of the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services. Collaborative Reform Initiative for Technical Assistance and Obama Era initiative that allowed local police departments to voluntarily enter into a cooperative process to reform their practices and which assisted police departments that wished to address excessive use of force and other problems. Under Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions, the COPS initiative still keeps the reform name in its title, but this administration's reform has nothing to do with implementing real change. Instead, according to DOJ's guidelines, the money Congress approved for the initiative will now fund programs that have a nexus to crime reduction goals and fighting violent crime. Furthermore, Jeff Sessions ordered a review of all federal consent decrees, which allowed the Department of Justice to investigate and work with local police departments to remedy patterns of excessive force, discrimination, and civil rights violations. Many police forces across the country, such, such as the police departments in cities like Ferguson, Missouri, and Baltimore, <laughs> Maryland, entered into consent decrees with the Department of Justice. Jeff Sessions says that consent decrees can reduce morale at police departments. Not only has Sessions worked to reduce the number of future consent decree decrees, but his Justice Department even tried to delay the consent decree with Baltimore that was initiated by the Obama administration in the wake of Freddie Gray's 2015 death in police custody. Last year, I introduced the Demanding Oversight from Justice Act or DOJ Act to respond to this administration's indifference to appropriately addressing civil rights violations by law enforcement and to direct the DOJ to take action. Many of my colleagues and I are working to force the administration to take appropriate action. Before we move forward with the, before you know, I came and you moved forward already. I would like to give a special acknowledgement to a very special uh, guest, C. 
seated in the front row of the audience. And I guess we had intended to have some of the mothers of the movement here, uh, but we were not able to work that out. Some of them are here uh, for the Congressional Black Caucus Week, uh, but they're in various uh, forms uh, throughout the day and tomorrow. But I just want to say that these brave mothers and advocates understand more than perhaps any others just how important these topics we're discussing today are. And so I'm so proud of them. And even though they're not here, let me just tell you uh, who some of them are that I've worked with. Uh, Geneva Reed Veal, the mother of Sandra Bland, who died in custody July 13, 2015, after Texas Trooper Brian Encinia stopped her for a minor traffic infraction and arrested her. And then, of course, there's Miss Gwen Carr, the mother of Eric Gardner, who was killed in a chokehold by a New York City police officer, Daniel uh, Panaleo, on July 17, 2014. And then Mrs. Samaria Rice, the mother of 12-year-old Tamir Rice, who was shot and killed while he was holding a pellet gun in Park on November 22, 2014, by Cleveland, Ohio police officer uh, Timothy Lohman. And then, of course, Mrs. Leslie McSpadden, the mother of Michael Brown, the unarmed 18-year-old who was killed on August 9, 2014, by Ferguson, Missouri police officer Darren Wilson. And then there's Miss Lucy, Lucia Lucy Macbeth, the mother of 17-year-old Jordan David Davis. And she is running for office, and she has passed the primary in Atlanta. And so uh, we all should give her some support and I'm hopeful that I'll be able to see her this weekend and help to work on some uh, financing for that campaign. As you know, Jordan was shot and killed in November 2012 at the parking lot of a Jacksonville gas station uh, by a white man, Michael Dunn, who complained that Jordan and his friends were playing music too loudly. And then there's Mrs. Cleotra, uh, Cleopatra Cow Cowley, the mother of 15-year-old honor student, Hadia Pendleton, who was shot and killed in a Chicago park in January 2013, a week after performing at President Barack Obama's second inauguration. These women who have suffered such tragedy have now become an incredibly powerful force for change. They're fighting so that other families in our communities do not experience the tragedy they have endured. So even though they're not here, let's give them a round of applause. While these mothers uh, have truly become influential leaders, they are not the only ones speaking out. There are countless people in our society who are understandably upset by the string of high-profile tragedies involving people of color. There are countless individuals in our society who are understandably disturbed by the heartless, destructive, and immoral po policies of Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions. There are countless people in our society who are understandably infuriated that a sitting president has repeatedly incited violence against those who don't look like or think like him and actively encourage police misconduct. In response to the Charlottesville, Virginia Unite the Right rally, this president blamed the victims for the violence perpetrated against them by white supremacists, the KKK, Nazis, and the alt-right, saying there is blame on both sides. This is a president who issued his first pardon to Joe Apayo, the former sheriff of Macopa County, Maricopa County, Arizona, who was convicted of criminal contempt for willfully violating a court order, preventing him from violating individual civil rights. This is a president who has time and time again dishonored our Constitution. So while Donald Trump is stoking the flames and encouraging alt-right and white supremacist groups, the FBI is turning its focus and attention to black activists, a leaked August 27 report apparently prepared by the FBI Domestic Terrorism Analysis Unit announced the existence of the black identity extremist movement, deeming it a violent threat. The report links a handful 
of violent incidents to the notion of a broader domestic threat from those who are upset by police violence and racial inequities in the criminal justice system. So many of my colleagues and I are deeply concerned that the FBI's use of this black identity extremist label signals an attempt to blur the lines between isolated and deplorable incidents of violence and peaceful and constitutionally protected civil rights and social justice activism. The potential implications of the BIE designation are troubling. Will the FBI and the Donald Trump Jeff Sessions Justice Department revert to some of the tactics used in the 1960s and 1970s by using aggressive and unwarranted surveillance and other law enforcement actions against individuals and groups that want nothing more than to exercise their First Amendment rights. So, I'm so excited that I have been joined by all of the wonderful people who you have been hearing from today. Let me just say again, Ms. Christian Clark, the President and Executive Director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law, uh, is a great leader in this country, doing some wonderful things. I'm so delighted she's been here. Give her another big round of applause. <laughs> we were supposed to have um, with us today Mr. Benjamin Crump who was going to focus on race policing and stand your ground laws. But as it was announced, he has gone on to Dallas to deal with that incident where another young black man was killed by a police officer in his own living room. <laughs> now, uh, I'm gonna go on and introduce the rest of this panel, but let me say this about this incident. First of all, this police officer lived in the building. She lived downstairs under this black man. She had to know that he lived upstairs over her. She's in and out of this all the time. And you know, being a police officer, she knows who everybody else is in the building uh, because she's got to be worried about whether or not they're gonna be concerned about her and her activities. So she knew that he lived upstairs. I understand there's now a video that shows her pacing back and forth in front of that apartment and I don't know for how long, and I don't know what she was pacing about, but I do know this. I don't know how she got in with a key or without a key, but she knew that was not her apartment when she walked in the door. You know your place where you live. You know your furniture. You know the color of your walls. You know everything. And so we got to dig deeper into this. Something's wrong with this picture. I want to know how well did she know him. I want to know whether or not there were some words exchanged between them. I want to know if she was mad about something. I want to know why it was that she didn't remember where she lived. She's on the police department. She's supposed to be more well-versed in observations than the average person. She's supposed to know when she sees somebody running what the height was, what the weight was, what they looked like, what the color was, and she didn't know her own apartment. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I think that um, Mr. Crump is, is going to do an absolute fabulous job uh, getting involved in this case, but I want all of us, as we talk to the various radio programs, as we talk to the media in any way, ask the questions. Keep asking the questions. Don't let this go, well, we're gonna wait until they investigate. Hell, we gonna help them investigate. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, you know, without even looking at the rest of this, this has been, <laughs> This has been a time when police are calling, uh, 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 people are calling the police on us for every little thing that they can find. Uh, whether or not you're studying, you know, on the university in a room or where students study, and you're a student at the university, and for some reason, because of your color, you're not supposed to be there. And then uh, you're picnicking and barbecuing in the park. Uh, that is a part for everybody to use in the area. But somehow, 
You're not supposed to use the barbecue pits. You're not supposed to have a picnic. You're not supposed to barbecue because of your color. I'm so pleased what he did. He said, black folks everywhere, come on out and let's have a real barbecue. <laughs> and on and on and on. And the 12-year-old cutting grass. Now, I was so proud of him at 12 years old. You're trying to earn a little money. You're cutting grass. You know, we're forever being criticized. Our children don't want to work. Uh, you know, they don't have jobs. And, and here he is, 12 years old. And this woman next door said, oh, he got on my side of the lawn. And that lawnmower ran over a little bit of my grass. Woman, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And so we've got to. Keep talking it up. Don't forget about these issues when you go to church. Don't forget about them when with your girlfriends at the brunch. Don't, don't not talk about them with your social clubs and organizations. Keep the conversation going. Keep the conversation going so that everybody know that these issues are on our mind and that we're not going to relent. We're not going to be intimidated. We're not going to walk away and say, oh my God, I'm sorry, I wish that hadn't happened. We're going to pray. No, we're going to pray, and we're going to work. Yeah. And we're going to speak up, and we're going to question, and we're going to go to police commission hearings. We're going to go to our city council hearings. We're going to call in our elected officials at the local levels who hold these police budgets. They determine whether or not they can get raises. They determine what their pensions are. They determine so much about their ability you know, to be a police officer, and yet we let our elected officials go without questioning them, why did you vote to support him? Why didn't you ask some questions when they came before the committee? And so we've got work to do. You know, people ask all the time, what can I do? And I don't know if people are expecting us to say that we want you overnight to become an attorney or that we want you to do something grand. No, we want you just to take your everyday life and create the conversation and the discussion to put it on the minds of everybody. And let me tell you, church is not just a place where you go to pray and listen to the preacher. You know, they have these Wednesday night prayer meetings and all of that. Bring up the subjects, talk about them. If you don't, you're gonna see what happened at Aretha Franklin's funeral, where that eulogy was given. And the eulogy that was given literally was shaming us because supposedly, particularly black women, can't raise black men. How many black men in here been raised by your mama? <laughs> we love it when there are two parents in the household. We even like it when grandmama is there to help out. But don't you dare say that a black woman cannot raise a black man. Uh, because we do it all the time, and the black men who are raised by us just love us to death. Is that right? Huh? Love mama, right? All right. Okay. Okay. So I just had to divert a little bit from all of this and, and say that. Ms. Jessalyn McCurdy, the Deputy Director of the Washington Legislative Office of the ACLU, Thank you for being here to discuss the intersection between race, policing, and criminal justice legislation. Ms. Nikichi Taifa, yeah. the advocacy director for the Criminal Justice for the Open Society Foundation, who forever has been talking with us, has been at every one of these criminal justice forums we have done, particularly focusing on mandatory minimum sentences and criminal justice le legislative efforts. She has been a stalwart working on this and other issues, and she speaks her mind too. Please give her a big round of applause. And so did Kimba have to leave? Where's Kimba? Oh, there's Kimba. Oh. I'm looking down, I'm looking down at this chair for her. Well, I want you to know, you know that this is Ms. Kimba Smith Prather of the Kimba Smith Foundation, and she really got us focused on mandatory minimum sentences. I know she shared her story with you. Uh, she is really the poster child for what was wrong with mandatory minimum sentencing. And I want you to know, is your mom and dad here by any chance? They're on their way. They're on their way. Her mom and dad walked the halls of Congress. 
They knocked on the doors of everybody in the media. They told the story and they worked and worked and worked until we began to learn better what was going on and we began to teach you know, our communities about mandatory minimum sentencing and those who were languishing in our prisons and our jails accused many times under these conspiracy laws yes. that they made up simply because you were on the telephone talking to somebody. And I remember one case where we had some brothers talking to each other and they were using slang and the white FBI people didn't understand what they were talking about. And so they accused them of being, of talking about something with drugs, et cetera, et cetera. But those conspiracy laws were absolutely devastating. And so Kimba, a wonderful young lady coming from a beautiful family in college, doing what we say you should do, and the unfortunate way that she met somebody who she fell in love with, and it just turned out to be the wrong person. And many of us have gone through that experience. We know about that. Oh, I didn't hear you. <laughs> okay, then, okay. And so she became a victim. Uh, but not only did her parents work, but she worked and she still works. She cares about those who she left behind and others who came after her. And she has done a wonderful job of being a representative for dealing with mandatory minimum sentencing and changing the laws. She worked with the members of Congress and she worked with Bobby Scott and others to change these laws. And she's an example of the kind of service that you can give no matter what has happened to you or what has not happened to you. Give Kim a big round of applause. Love you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me just say this. This is a bad time, to put it mildly. In these United States, with the president, the likes of Donald Trump, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I think he's the most deplorable, the most despicable human being I've ever encountered. He's a liar, he's dangerous, he's alienated all of our allies, and he's in bed with Putin, the oligarchs, and the Kremlin of Russia. And I started out early on researching him and his allies. I believe there has been collusion, and I'm just waiting on Mola, our special counsel, to get those dots connected so we can put him in jail or impeach him. And. You know, they're saying that a sitting president cannot be indicted. And Mr. Kavanaugh, who is over on the Senate side, basically has said that a sitting president cannot be indicted. So why do you think the president picked him? To be on the Supreme Court. He picked him because he's already committed to him. No matter what they find out about you, if it comes to this court, I will be the leader in saying that there's nowhere in the law or the Constitution that allows them uh, to indict you. And then this president is so outrageous and egotistical, he said, I can pardon anybody and I can even pardon myself. Well, he may be able to pardon himself, but we're able, if we really do our job, to get him impeached and see if he can pardon himself from that. I don't think so. I don't think so. It is the responsibility of the members of Congress, according to the Constitution of the United States of America, to deem whether or not there have been, uh, what is it, high crimes and misdemeanors that are committed by the President of the United States of America and then, of course, you can impeach them. But we're not doing our job. We're not doing our job because the Republicans are in charge. They have the numbers. And they are intimidated, some of them. Some of them like absolutely what he's doing. They're not going to speak against him. They're not going to go against him no matter what he does. And they claim they're more patriotic than we are. Wow. They claim patriotism, and we've allowed them to do it. 
we've allowed them to talk about they stand up for the flag and they love their country and the president of the United States can't even sing the Star Spangled Banner, doesn't know the words to it. And we've allowed them to claim this patriotism and you can see very clearly now that they're not willing to stand up for country. But guess why this is our responsibility? Not only to claim our patriotism, but to see to it that this president is out of office because of the price that we have paid. The price that we have paid in this country to try and get justice and equality. And I want some of you who are in the audience to understand that we understand. And I want some of you to understand about your relatives, all of you who served in this country's wars, who served in the military, in any of the branches of the military, that many served and came home to a situation where they didn't even have a decent home to live in, couldn't get a job. But guess what? We stayed with this country. We supported the democracy. We believe that equality and justice was, was possible. And we have worked for it. And we have paid a price for it. And we have people who have died because they believed in this democracy. And so you think we're going to stand up and let something like 45 dismantle it? I don't think so. And so I want you to leave here today inspired to talk it up and to live a life of knowing that you deserve justice and equality, that nobody is better than you or I, that nobody deserves to be treated with more respect than we do. We have paid a price for this democracy, and we have strengthened the democracy. We have made it better, not only because we were fighting for ourselves, but we were fighting for everybody else to be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to know uh, that when I am fighting for those young people who are in detention centers, when I understand the devastation of a mother being separated from her child or a father being separated, and some of those mothers are now deported and out of the country and their children are still here in detention centers, when I fight for them, I'm fighting for us. That's right. And you know why? I know it is right to fight against separation of mothers and fathers and families because of what happened to us in slavery. That's right. That's right. They sold us on the auction block. They sent the father to one plantation. They sent children to other plantations. They sent little girls to be in the big house, right? They separated us. And then after separation, all of the indignities that we have suffered, all of the discrimination and the racism that we have suffered and then they say somehow because we demand our rights we want affirmative action that we don't deserve they better get out of my way <laughs> thank you for being at this criminal justice forum today thank you for caring enough to get to washington many of you travel here to participate we look forward to your being here every year and we hope that it is meaningful, that it is inspiring, and that we are strengthened by coming together to deal with these issues. In the final analysis, we can win, but you gotta fight. If you don't fight, you'll never know whether or not you could have won. Are you in a fighting mood? Yes. Are you gonna do the business of our people? Yes. Are you gonna talk it up? Yes. And are you gonna make people listen to you? I love you and thank you so very much. Okay, we actually are gonna keep going for another 10 minutes and take some questions. We definitely wanted to hear from all of you before you leave today. So I'm going to ask folks to line up if you have some questions. And we'll hear first from the gentleman in the white shirt. Uh, please, uh, we'll take the questions. I have to leave, uh, but we do want you to have that opportunity. Thank you so much. Long live the queen. Long live the queen. Long live the queen. Long live the queen. 
Okay, first question. Right. As the Congresswoman so, notes, we need to change this administration, number one. But um, let me turn to the panelists. So that's one of the things that I know in, in Virginia there, just the ACLU just released a report um, about women in incarceration. Um, ultimately, unless you all have some other, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a layman that's a person impacted, but um, there's nothing being done about women in, in imprisonment. Um, in my opinion, um, with women in incarceration, uh, what's not looked at is the trauma or the reasons as far as why a woman has gotten into this, gone down the pathway of incarceration. And so for me, I know um, I was in an abusive situation. Um, there were witnesses to the abuse that I had expert testimony at my sentencing, but my 86-year-old judge was asleep during this testimony because I could have gotten a downward departure based on coer coercion and duress, but that was something that wasn't even taken in consideration. So between mental um, illness, um, trauma, domestic violence and abuse, none of these things are taken in consideration or the fact that the primary the majority of women in prison are primary caretakers. And so that's something, and that's a whole nother discussion as far as me giving birth to my son. And, you know, he's 23 year old, years old today. And there's still some ramifications. And we provided the best for him. My parents provided the best for him. But there's still some ramifications of him being a child who had an incarcerated parent. And I just, I just wanted to add to that that, um, Andrea James, who is a formerly incarcerated yeah. woman that Kimba knows very well, yeah. has started an organization called the National Council for Formerly Incarcerated and, incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And she is doing a lot of work around the country to fight uh, or d address the, okay. the issues that result in women being incarcerated. Uh, again, on the federal level, primarily mandatory minimums in the system and the way it works. She, we're, she's actually, we are actually having a conference at the end of um, this month in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because of the fact that it is the leading, um, that, that women are, are incarcerated at the highest rate in, uh, in the state of Oklahoma. And we're coming to Oklahoma to address or, or try to address or begin to strategize around the reasons why and how we can address them. But um, one of the ways that we, one of the, some of the things that we really need to look at, again, is diversion programs. And that's, I don't know if people know what diversion programs are. It's basically before you put a woman, particularly a woman that has children in jail, that because there's so many rippling effects of putting a woman in jail, you're putting a woman, you're putting her family, you're putting her children, you're putting her parents in jail. We need to look at ways that we can keep uh, women out of jail and not be our first response be being incarcerating women. Like that, that's one of the first things we need to look at. We also need to look at the fact that um, Kimba uh, talked about a very important issue with women, and that's the trauma that women su suffer, whether it's physical, sexual trauma. There are studies out there that say as many as over 50% of the women who are involved in the criminal justice system have been traumatized on one level or another. And that then re often results in women self-medicating themselves, which then ultimately um, results in them ending, ending up in prison for drugs or alcohol or things associated with those types of crimes. And so those, we have to deal with that. We have to tackle the trauma 
that women in this country experience and so that we can again stop trying to on the back end of the system throw people a few days to get out of prison after their life is already ruined your life is ruined when you go to prison it's particularly if you get out and you don't have the support system to help you to recover so we have to address the, the, again, the, the factors and the things that cause women to go to prison. Domestic violence, trauma, and many of the other um, things that result from those, those issues. And then finally, we must reform the conspiracy laws. The drug conspiracy laws, one of the main reasons why women in particular are ensnared in the system is a result of these conspiracy, very overbroad, uh, conspiracy law. Sometimes it's just answering the dollar law. I mean, I'm talking about Literally. very innocuous Literally. type of scenarios that end you up with a mandatory minimum sentence. Okay, so we need to um, do those things as well. Mm -hmm. Let's take one last question. And if not, then I'm going to turn the floor over to our panelists to help close us out. And I'll just say this, as we um, prepare to leave the room today, ag again, I'm so grateful for the Congresswoman's leadership making sure that this issue, this crisis is front and center for us every time that we convene here um, each year. And I think people tend to leave feeling a sense of powerless, feeling a, a bit powerless when we talk about mass incarceration. There are three things that I want to encourage you to do. One, vote, vote. and make sure that everyone in your network votes vote. this cycle. And it's not vote. just about you, it's the power of our collective vote. Because truly, our, the collective power of our vote can help to bring about transformation of the criminal justice system. We've talked about electing reform-minded district attorneys. It doesn't stop there. We can hold our mayors accountable. They're the ones who put in place the police chiefs who decide whether or not to punish officers who use force without basis. Sheriffs who run the jails are an elected office that we tend to ignore. Mm -hmm. So it's not just DAs. There are many players in the criminal justice system who we can hold accountable at the ballot box. Right. Number two, run. Run for office. It is inspiring seeing all of the young people and millennials and African American women who are running for office all across the country. Black folks who are running for governor in Maryland, Florida, uh, Georgia. Georgia. Uh, so run, run uh, for every office on the ballot from top to bottom. And then three, as the Congresswoman says, show up. Show up to these hearings, raise your voice and raise them loudly. I want to make sure that you have two numbers that you can plug into your phone today. And the first number is the number for Congress, 202-224-3121. Make sure that you are holding your elected officials accountable. Make sure you call them and tell them vote no on Kavanaugh. Make sure you tell them hold Attorney General Jeff Sessions accountable for not doing his job running the Justice Department the right way. The second and last number I want to leave you with is 866-OUR-VOTE. 866-OUR-VOTE. At the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, we run a program called Election Protection. It's the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection program. Make sure you report voter suppression when you see it happening in your community. But give that number out so people know uh, when elections are happening in their community. Know what they need when they show up at the polls. And most importantly, have a place to report questions and complaints on election day. Thank you. I'm going to have our panelists close this out with brief, brief words. Can you give us that number? Yes. 202. 224-3121, 202-224-31. I'll tell you, members of Congress pay attention to the volume of calls that they're getting from the public on issues, and they sit up straight the more we call. So bring pressure to bear, call your elected official and hold them accountable. An 866-hour vote. Kemba? Um, my final statements, and it, it goes along with that. Um, one of the collateral consequences to a person going incarcerated, depending on what state you live in, is um, you lose your right to vote. So in the state of Virginia, even after I came home, um, was working a job back in college, doing so many wonderful things across the country, um, on election day, I still could not vote. And I tried to act like it didn't bother me, but realistically, 
um, I felt less than everyone else. And so I don't understand why this nation, why our legislators cannot get it through their heads that voting is a basic fundamental human right. And so once people come out of prison, why wouldn't you want them politically involved? Because that shows that they have an interest, they have an investment in their community. And so um, I've done several things revolved around that, but for those of you all that do have your right to vote, don't let any election go by and you don't absentee yes. vote or go to the poll. I, and in the light of what we're now, I have to be real. When I was in college and I had my rights just before I went into the prison system, I wasn't active the way that I should have been. But once I went into the prison system at 23 and got sentenced to 24 and a half years longer than I had been on this earth, and then I got in that prison system and I started reading about our culture, our history, and this capitalistic nature of this prison industrial complex, and then I came out of prison, and once that right was restored to me, do you know I boo-hoo cried because I was at a press conference with the NAACP because I was woke, working on um, voter suppression laws, and um, my husband said, wow, you had snot coming out your nose and everything, <laughs> because that was so important to me. And so please do not waste that vote, because nowadays it is very costly, and we need each and every vote that we can get. So thank you. And, and let me just interject here. 5.85 million people in our country can't vote because of racist laws that are still on the books in places like Virginia that strip away the right to vote based on uh, criminal conviction. Florida has one of the worst rates yes. in the country, and there is a ballot yep. initiative yes. that's up in November yes, that can you. change that yep. if people turn out to vote. That's right. Uh, so I just wanted to contextualize. One in 13 African Americans can't vote nationwide uh, because these laws still remain and linger on the books in many states. Thank you, Kemba. You're welcome. So yeah, that's a very, very important point. So we know those of us in our community who cannot vote, but those of us who can vote have to vote in their honor. Yeah. We have to, we, I don't care what the weather is like, I don't care what your, what your conditions are, we have to vote in every election, particularly this one coming up in November, because this election, as, as many have said, is one of the most important elections we have seen in our lifetime because we are experiencing an administration who is hell-bent on undermining democracy in this country, through, whether it's through Russian collusion or just a different vision for what this country should look like. And that vision is no black people, all white people. Mm -hmm. We have to use our power. I don't care what type of laws they're passing in your state, what type of, of poll, I mean, they're going through the a system now where there are a strategy now where they try to close down polls in our communities to make it more difficult for us to find a place where we can vote. But we have to think ahead and we have to be two steps ahead of them because they're doing everything to take that right away, and that should tell you something right there. The fact that they will do anything to stop you from voting should be the very reason that you should go out and vote and tell everybody in your community, in your family, in your churches that the fact that they're trying to take it away shows you how precious the right to vote is. So today we are not only living in a time of adversity, we are living in a time of hostility. We survived, though, the slave ships and the cotton fields and the cane plantations and the tobacco farms and the dogs and the hoses, and we will survive Donald Trump Amen. and Jeff Sessions. Yes. Yeah. I know it ain't easy, y'all, because I can tell you, honestly, I get tired a lot. But when I get tired, I think about what Harriet Tubman yes. did for a living, and I get a second breath. Yes, Rosa Parks went to jail. But there was a movement that stepped into play a set of circumstances that not only got her into out of jail, but began to change the landscape of this country. And I say we need, again today, another movement, a movement against mass incarceration, what I call the justice movement, a movement where we wear these badges and say, we are the ones 
that we have been waiting for. A movement where we shout from the rooftop, justice now, justice now, justice now. A movement where everyone does what each one of us have been talking about today that gets out and votes. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining us today. We have a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of fighting to do. Um, look forward to staying in touch and we will survive, we will overcome. I'd like to close out by just sharing a few names. You mentioned Harriet Tubman. Let me mention a few other names of people who are no longer with us. Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Terrence Crutcher, Alton Sterling, Jamar Clark, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Akai Gurley, Stefan Clark, Laquan McDonald, and now we add Botham Jean to that list. Thank you.